Well, there's a lot going on in the world today. If you watch the news, uh, if you don't, all the better. But, uh, you know, there's weird and deadly weather, weather patterns. Uh, things are getting ugly, except in central Alberta, where it's pretty sweet. Um, there's right-wing populism overtaking politics all over the world. There's elections coming up very soon, right here in our own country. There's Iran bombing Saudi Arabia, maybe. We don't know who's telling the truth there, if that really happened. India and Pakistan are uh, getting into war over there. China and Korea are not happy with each other. Things are aflame or flooded kind of all over the place. Pretty head-shaking stuff. So I thought what I'd do uh, this morning is um, begin with something absolutely relevant to our lives here in the 21st century. Something ripped from the headlines. Something that's on all of our minds these days. And that is the Holy Roman Empire. <laughs> or in German, das Heilige Römische Reich. Uh, and that name was spoken in German because Rome was never part of the Holy Roman Empire. Now throughout its 800 year existence. There in Central Europe, it comprised Germany, what's now Germany, Austria, Czech Republic, Switzerland, Liechtenstein, can't forget Liechtenstein, uh, parts of the Netherlands, France, Belgium, Luxembourg, but little parts of what's now Slovenia and Poland. And for some years toward the end, little parts of Northern Italy. Now many of us here, unless um, you are of purely uh, um, British uh, heritage, or, or unless you're from uh, Africa or Asia, but if, if, if you, your descendants are from Central Europe, it is uh, almost 100% possibility that uh, we are descendants of people who lived in the Holy Roman Empire and didn't know names like Germany, Austria, Italy. No, it was the Heilige Römische Reich. It was a very loose collection of kingdoms, princedoms, dukedoms, and electors presided over by an elected emperor, usually a Habsburg or a Hohenstaufen, who lived in Vienna and who in some centuries had a lot of power, way too much, and in other centuries almost none at all. But it was religion that finally diminished and broke up the Holy Roman Empire. Some of the uh, constituent princes followed Luther or Zwingli or uh, Calvin and went all Protestant. And some kings and princes remained Catholic. And an untold number of imperial gallons of blood were shed. And an obscene amount of atrocities were committed in religious wars in the Holy Roman Empire over its centuries. And all of this disorganization and map shifting and blood wars prompted French philosopher Voltaire to remark in the early 18th century that the Holy Roman Empire was, you know where I'm going here, don't you? Was neither holy, nor Roman, nor an empire. Now why in the world do I bring this up? It's because... Um, over the coming month, before Thanksgiving, we'll have a look at another famous misnamed institution. Something has been diminished, I think, by religion. It's the Sermon on the Mount. Those three chapters in the Gospel of Matthew that contain the core of the teaching of Jesus of Nazareth. Those passages that so many learned people uh, in history have called the greatest collection of wisdom ever collected, ever produced on the earth. The Sermon on the Mount was neither a sermon nor was it preached on a mount. Oh, it could have been a sermon, I suppose, on a, on a gentle hillside uh, there on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, but it would have been really hard for anybody to hear out there if Jesus were on some sort of a mountain and, you know, 
yelling to, to crowds down there. I mean, it would, it would be even harder for the listeners to absorb so much concentrated wisdom at one time that you find in those three chapters of Matthew. So the reason that this loose collection of sayings and aphorisms and seemingly unrelated scraps of wisdom is presented by the writer of the Gospel of Matthew of having been spoken on a mountain is because Matthew was writing for a Jewish audience. And that makes all the difference. Some of these sayings are paralleled in the Gospel of Luke where it's called, anybody know? Sermon on the Plain. The Sermon on the Plain. Because Luke doesn't care if Jesus is on a mountain while he's delivering this sermon. It's a big difference. To us, not much. But to those first century readers, it was kind of a big deal. So, um, Matthew, whoever he was, nobody knows and nobody will ever know who the gospel writer was. Wanted to present this Galilean wisdom teacher, this former construction worker, to the relatively sophisticated people of Judea. Sophisticated as, appeared, as, a, as opposed to the, the North Country rural folk, the Galileans. Wanted to present this wisdom teacher as the new Moses. The new Moses. Matthew was interested in comparing Jesus favorably to Moses, the founder of the Hebrew faith, now called Judaism, uh, after the, the, the sole surviving Hebrew tribe. And the very name Moses is an Egyptian name that means divine birth or divine son. It sounds like another Hebrew word that's picked up in, the, in Genesis uh, to sound like drawn from the water, but that's not actually the etymology of it. In, in, Egypt, in Egyptian, it means divine son, divine birth. So he uses that name, does Matthew, and the story of Moses to make his argument that Yeshua Hanotri or Jesus of Nazareth in English, Jesus the Nazarene is even greater than Moses. Even greater than Moses. Who could possibly be greater than Moses? Here's, here's some examples. Just as Pharaoh killed all the baby boys of the Hebrews and only Moses is saved, so also Herod, the king of Israel, at the birth of Jesus, kills all the male babies in Bethlehem, and only Jesus is saved. No surprise about that story. When Moses' life is in danger, he flees from Egypt to what's now Israel, but returns to Egypt after many years. So too, when Jesus' life is in danger, he takes the reverse itinerary from Israel to Egypt and later back to Israel. And just as Moses goes up a mountain to receive the law from God, including the Ten Commandments, you know, you've seen Charlton Heston stand there with them. This is in the book of Exodus. So also Jesus goes up to a mountain to give a new law to the people. And that's the reason and the only reason that this is a sermon on the mount. It has nothing to do where, with what Jesus, where Jesus may have been sitting when he was saying this. Matthew wanted to portray Jesus as a great teacher, a prophet and lawgiver, equal or even greater than Moses. The greatest figure in his audience's spiritual world. So just as Moses was thought to have written the first five books of the Bible, let's say them together, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Excellent, excellent. Oh, thank you. That warmed my heart. <laughs> so also the teaching of Jesus is contained in the five speeches or extended discourses in Matthew's gospel. The first of which is this Sermon on the Mount. So rather than reach for a Bible, which we've taken out of the pews and, and disappeared to the back room there, um, or rather than reach for a Bible at your house, 
I have this new law for you here in, uh, in booklet form, in two translations for you to take home and peruse at your leisure. Um, I've taken out the chapter and verse numbers uh, so that it doesn't look like the Bible, but merely like the collection of sayings that it, uh, it really is. So ushers, uh, come forward if, if you will. Let's pass these out. And I'll tell you what's in here while they're being passed out. Now, um, if you're in a household with two people, go ahead and just take, take one. Uh, there's 110 copies. I think we'll, we'll be close here. <clears throat> now, the Hebrew characters that spell out Yeshua HaNotzri are there at the very top, just to remind us how ancient and foreign and Jewish this stuff really is. It's 12 pages long. 12 is a nice biblical number. And it clearly displays these discrete sayings in two translations. So we have got the New Revised Standard on the left there from 1986. And then on the right, it's the Eugene Peterson paraphrase done in the late 1990s. And the paragraphs line up so that you can see what Peterson does with, uh, with each fragment of text. Now, the titles of each passage are quite arbitrary, uh, not in the original text, of course. And there's also some textual notes in the left column when the English translation is particularly puzzling. You know, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of uh, notes there for you. Uh, where the English doesn't have, quite have the fine gradation that the original Greek does. <clears throat> now, you could take this booklet outside uh, and read it on a hillside, but those are really hard to find around here. Or you could take it to Banff for Jasper for that full mountaintop experience. Um, when you get it, what have I done with my copy? <laughs> I gave it away. Okay. Um, when, when you get the, uh, the, your copy, just look at the first teachings. There's an introduction there that leads into chapter 5. Just look at the first, the first stuff there. It's the Beatitudes, right? The things that make for blessedness or happiness. The Greek word there is makarios, which means uh, a lot of things. You can see where, it, where other translations there. But the Beatitudes claim happiness for the very opposite of what we think bring those things. Then just thumb through as you get them and, and notice the quotable quotes. As you go through it, you'll see the salt of the earth, the city on a hill, the light under a bushel. You'll see about dealing with anger and infidelity, swearing and retaliation. Not that any of us have to deal with that, but there it is just in case. Loving your enemies, praying in secret, the Lord's Prayer is there. The idea of not serving God and money, or mammon as Jesus called it, a Canaanite God. Not worrying about your finances or your health or your stuff. Some talk about not judging others, asking God for what you need. And then comes the golden rule. Wolves in sheep's clothing, the wide road and the narrow gate. And then the last saying in the collection, the hearers and doers of these words, which we'll get to in just a minute. So uh, still short, we're still short. Okay, we'll, we'll make more. <laughs> just like Doritos, we'll, we'll make more. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, take a look, if you will, once you've got your copy at uh, the bottom of page 11. These are the closing words of the Sermon on the Mount. I got it. And
and the writer chose these words very skillfully, um, and, and you'll, you'll see why. Uh, Claire will uh, read this for us. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was its fall. There's a Sunday school song about this. Do you remember it? The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And the rain came tumbling down. Yeah, sure. And the floods came up. <laughs> the rains came down. And the floods came up. The rains came down. And the floods came up. And the... Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, we're reaching back a good 60 years here. Um, But see, um, thank you, Heather. That was really helpful. <laughs> I forgot those middle words. Unlike the president of a certain large North American country who infamously said to his second wife out of a series of three, um, it doesn't matter what I do. People need to hear what I have to say. It doesn't matter what I do. Jesus says something else. Jesus says it matters. It matters what you think and what you do. The Sermon on the Mount is just another sermon unless the precepts contained in it are actually performed, are actually acted out in real time and space. Watch how I do it, Jesus says in one of the translations you've got there. Watch how I do it. Walk with me and work with me. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. As a comedian once said, and most rhythm comes from comedy these days, um, reading about music is like dancing about architecture. Reading about music is like dancing about architecture. You have to play the music. You have to sing the music for it to come alive and make any difference in life. Just reading about it is like a house built on sand. Now it's like that with anything, right? We can read about watercolor painting or photography or surgery or cooking, or, but until you do these things, our lovely houses or our, our knowledge are built on an unstable beach. That's what Jesus is saying in these last words of the Sermon on the Mount. So now that we've read the last words and what Jesus is trying to sum up, we'll, we'll begin uh, next week uh, a little earlier in this collection. So please take these booklets home, and again, next week we'll have more of them. And uh, get familiar once again with these words of Jesus. We've all heard them before. If you've been hanging, hanging around churches for a while, you've heard all this before. Often in the King James Version, right? Don't worry about wherewithal ye shall be clothed, right? Beautiful language. But um, we need to modernize it and make it ours. It's important to know the sayings of the Sermon on the Mount. Just like it's important to know the texts of any subject that you're studying. But how much more important it is to act on these texts, put the knowledge of them into action. Jesus says, don't call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say. Walk with me and work with me. Then go and do what I do. When Jesus is up on the Mount of Transfiguration and his clothes are dazzling white and, and, the, and the disciples want to make uh, little, little shrines. A voice comes from heaven and said, this is my son. Listen to him. Don't build shrines. Listen to him and do what he says. So next week, 
we'll dig into what was going on when these lessons were taught. The question being, is this relevant to us at all in 21st century North America, or is it only for first century oppressed Judea? That's a question we'll ask next week. We'll look at the radical worldview of Jesus and get ready to hear what Jesus is teaching. Amen.